Five seconds to the open. Ready? Who wants to get this thing started right about now? Welcome to Follow the Money Weekly with your host, Jerry Robinson. Welcome. Not just some guru. Oh, oh, really? Your host is an economist and a best-selling author. What an interesting news item. I'd better write that down. And just someone who likes to make money and help you to make money. Welcome to Follow the Money Weekly. And here he is, Jerry Robinson. Ah, uh, friends, welcome to this week's edition of Follow the Money Weekly Radio. So glad that you're joining us all around the world. You can find us online at followthemoney.com. That's right, followthemoney.com. Right there, you'll find all kinds of free videos, podcasts, articles that we've done over the years. You can also find us on social media. We're at facebook.com and twitter.com. We even have a YouTube channel. Why are we here? We're here to help you. We're here to help you succeed in those things that you're trying to succeed in with your life. And how are you going to do that? Through having multiple streams of income. Friends, if you're dependent upon one stream of income for the rest of your life, you're going to be in trouble. Because what happens if something happens to that income stream, right? This is just how the world is set up today. We go to school. We are told to get a good job, right, a J-O-B, and that corporation then is on the hook to give us a paycheck to trade their money for our hours of time. And so it's like the old Doors song, the five to one song, it always reminds me that trading your hours for a handful of dimes, right? Now, there's nothing wrong uh, with having a job. I mean, that is honorable to have a job. The problem is, is that most people have one job and they are one paycheck away from living on the street, right? And I'm talking about most people. Now, there may be people in our audience today who say, I'm not in that place because I have saved money and I have developed a retirement plan and I've been investing my money. So I'm not one paycheck away from disaster and that's good for you. But there are people in the audience today who say, you know what? I am one paycheck away from disaster. I am living paycheck to paycheck, and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of living paycheck to paycheck. I'm sick of living in this cycle where I don't have enough money at the end of the month. I've got more month than money. And friend, I'm talking to you today because those of you who are in that situation, I can identify with you because I was there. I remember working a job that I didn't particularly like. I mean, it was, you know, a job that I had and it was a good job. I was blessed to have the job, but I didn't particularly like it. It wasn't really utilizing the gifts and talents that I had within me. It was just simply a paycheck. And at the time, I was not saving. So let me go back to that time whenever I was in your shoes. I was living and working and breathing one job I did not have my college degree yet, and I was trying to find my place in the world. You ever been there? I mean, that's certainly a real common place for a lot of young people today. I was working at this job, and I did not understand the importance of putting money back from my paycheck. Oh, I put money in the 401k plan. Don't get me wrong. When the Merrill Lynch guy came into the room and brought us free pizza and said, everybody needs to put money in their 401k Everyone should max out their 401k. Well, you know, I didn't know any difference. So I put my money in the 401k and I did indeed max it out. And I thought that I was doing right, right? I had no liquid savings, but I had my 401k being pumped full. I think it was 15% of my paycheck could go into the 401k. And I had 15% of my paycheck going into the 401k. Now, I want you to hear me. I was investing for retirement with a 401k, putting 15% of my paycheck into it, and I had no savings, okay? No savings. I had no physical savings. I did not have enough furniture in my house. I still had to make more purchases for to furnish my home. Uh, my car was not in good shape. I was probably going to need a new car, but I had no money in savings, okay? But I am maxing out my 401k. So can you you see where this is heading? Not too long later, what am I doing? Well, I'm raiding my 401k 
plan because I've been putting all of my savings in it. And so what I had to do in order to fix my car or furnish my home or get by on a rough month, I had to pull money out of my 401k. Now, how backwards is that? How backwards is that? That's exactly how financial planning and financial planners set you up today, right? Not all of them. We have really good financial planners here in America, and we have some not so good financial planners here in America. And many of them don't stress the importance of having a firm base of liquid savings. Friend, if you're going to survive in this economy, you need to have a a savings. You need to have a liquid savings. Now, I don't want to talk too much about the actual savings itself because we do have a lot on our website. You can go to our website, followthemoney.com forward slash save, and there you can read about creating a systematic savings plan. You can read about you know, uh, how much money we think you should save and how much, uh, you know, how you should diversify it. We have a lot to, we have a lot to say on savings in our five levels of financial freedom. But today, what I want to talk to you about is something known as the profit principle. Okay. So this is a principle that literally changed my life and it's found in the Bible. It's found in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23. And there it says, in all labor, there is profit. In all labor, there is profit. And so when I read this verse many years ago, the words just literally jumped off the page at me. And I began to discover that I did not have any profit from my labor. Now, what is profit? How do we define profit? Well, profit itself is simply defined as a financial benefit that is realized when the amount of revenue gained from a business activity exceeds the expenses, the costs, et cetera. So a profit is the surplus remaining after all of the expenses have been taken out, right? So if you're looking at a company's net profit, you're looking at gross revenues minus expenses, right? So that leaves you with this profit, right? And Of course, there's gross profit and there's net profit. There's all different kinds of profit. That's not the point today. The point is, is that profit is a gain. And so therefore, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 23, in all labor, there is profit. Is that true for you? Let me tell you something. It wasn't true for me. It wasn't true for me many years ago when I was working a dead end job. And I was stuffing all of my money into my 401k plan. And then I had to rate it because I didn't understand the importance of saving money and having liquidity, having money on the side if I need it. And it was here that I fully discovered the fact that I was actually working for zero profit. I realized that each month I did not save any money from my paycheck was a month that I did not earn a profit from my labor. Okay. So here's the profit principle. This is what the profit principle states. An individual's profit from his labor or work is equal to the amount of money that he saves. If we put this in mathematical terms, it simply means that your profit rate is your savings rate. So if you work at a job and your job pays you, say, you know, $3,000 per month, and then you take that money and you spend it all, in other words, you take it and you give it to other corporations, right? So you have a corporation you're working for, they give you $3,000. Let's say that's your leftover after taxes and everything. And then you go out and you take that $3,000 and you give part of it to this corporation, you give part of it to this corporation, you give part of it to this corporation, and then you give the rest to this corporation. And you, how much did you save? How much did you profit? What was your profit rate? and you discover your profit rate was a big fat goose egg. You took all the money that the corporation gave you in your paycheck and you gave it to other corporations. I mean, that's almost a definition of insanity. Who in the right mind would go to work every day at their job every single day for zero profit? Who in the right mind would do that? And apparently I did, right? Because I would go and I would get my paycheck. I would work at this job that I didn't care for so much. I would get my paycheck. I would go out and then I would give it to all these other corporations who 
were screaming at me through the billboards, screaming at me through the television, saying, you won't be happy unless you give us your money. And so I had to take the money from this corporation that I was working at in order to give it to these other corporations who told me I had to give it to them so I could be happy. I mean, it's just sheer financial insanity, right? And it's really a form of voluntary financial slavery because what happens is, is many people say, I don't have enough money, but thank goodness I have a credit card, right? So the credit card companies can keep us afloat. So not only do we give away, not only do most people give away all of their profit from their labor to other corporations without putting anything away for themselves, they also go into debt with credit card companies. So this is really a form of voluntary financial slavery today. We live in a time of voluntary financial slavery. Now, I want to tell you something today that the corporations will never tell you, right? You'll never hear this on a commercial. You'll never hear this in the evening news. But you have a fundamental financial right. And that is, that right is to earn a profit from your labor. It's biblical. It makes common sense that you should be able to control the profits that are created as a result of your hard work, right? Other corporations should not dictate to you how you spend those before you have a chance to decide yourself. This is why it's important to think of yourself sometimes as, you know, an enterprise or think of yourself as a business or as a free agent, so to speak. Think about large corporations. I mean, they operate their business to maximize profit, right? Maximizing profit, in fact, is required by publicly traded companies, they have to put the shareholder first and seek profits and profit maximization. The same way, uh, small business owners are dependent upon their profits to survive and thrive. So why shouldn't you view your job any differently? You would never agree to work at a job if they said you were not going to earn a profit, right? You would never do that knowingly, of course not. Yet millions of Americans work for zero profit because they save nothing. Now, after I discovered this proverb, Proverb 14, 23, where in all labor there is profit, my view of money began to be drastically changed. This was many years ago. This was especially, this was the very end of the late 1990s. And I was trading at the time. I was using money that I really didn't have to be trading. I wasn't saving anything from my paycheck except the money I was putting in my 401k, which then I had to later raid because I didn't have any savings. When I discovered this profit principle in Proverbs 14, 23, my view of money drastically changed. Suddenly, my wants and my needs, the true nature of them, came more sharply into focus. I began to prioritize and cut the fat from my monthly budget. Things that used to be important to me, such as maintaining a particular image or keeping up with the Joneses, began to fade. And by the way, if nobody's told you, the Joneses are broke, so there's no need to try to keep up with the Joneses. But listen, I urge you to really think about this profit principle in your own financial life. Are you making a profit from your labor? Are you putting away money every time you get a paycheck? Do you have some profit to point at and say, this was the profit from my labor? Or are you giving all of the paycheck away to the corporations who have deceived you into believing that you cannot survive without all of their stuff? Friends, I'm deadly serious today because people are hurting today. People are in financial stress today. People are facing marriage problems today. People are facing serious issues, even in their health because they are on the wrong track financially. But you know, you can get on the right track, but if you just sit there, you may get run over, right? So when you begin to plan, when you're really talking about saving money, you're talking about planning. You're talking about getting on the right track and then moving down that track, right? Staying on that track. Because if you just create a plan that never gets put into action, it's never going to bear any fruit. So how can you put this into action? How can you put the profit principle into action? Well, the very first step is to decide that you want to earn a profit from your labor, right? So if you're not currently saving any money and you don't have any liquid savings or you're not currently trying to save money, you need to take control of your money. 
right? You deserve a profit from all that labor you're doing. If you're working eight hours a day and you're not putting away any savings, then you have to ask yourself, would I ever do this under normal circumstances? If I was a business, could I survive like this? No, you have to earn a profit from your labor. Don't be ashamed to earn a profit from your labor. Put money back. And so what you really have to do, the very first step, is to determine what is your desired monthly profit rate. And we have to be realistic about this. You can't say, well, I want a 100% profit rate because that's not realistic, right? Unless you're living in your parents' basement rent-free and they're feeding you, which, hey, some of our listeners, you know, have that. They do live in their parents' basement rent-free. So if you're in that case, listen, you know, really, you can probably save a lot of your money. But realistically, most people are not in that situation. Most people are trying to feed mouths, right? They have mouths to feed. They have lots of bills. They have debt. They have, you know, jobs that they're trying to get raises at, or maybe they need more money. And so I understand it's difficult for the average person out there who's trying to get ahead. So what is a realistic and yet effective profit rate for you to set? In other words, what percentage of your monthly income could you strive to save each month? Well, let me begin with the goal in mind, and then we can always work backwards. My own goal, and I believe this is a goal that really should be all people's goals, is 15%. 15% of monthly income. And the reason I say that it should be a goal for everyone is because there are a lot of eroding factors on our money today. It used to be that financial advisors told you to save 10% of your income. And 10% is a fine number to save. But I believe that saving at least 15% of your income is important, as I mentioned, because of these eroding factors on money. You have lots of tremendous wealth-destroying effects that you must fight aggressively, and you can only do that by having enough money in savings, right? So the reality is, though, that most people are not prepared to start saving 15% of their income. They can't afford that right now. They would be in a financial bind. And so what I would say to you is that if you're barely just getting by right now, if you don't have enough money to barely even make it right now, you're living paycheck to paycheck, and you want to break that cycle, let me tell you, the very first step is to set your profit rate at 1%. Say, you know what? I'm not going to work for zero profit anymore. I'm going to set my profit rate at 1%. And you begin there. You begin at 1%. Don't be ashamed. Be ashamed for saving nothing, right? Don't be ashamed for saving 1%. And then say, well, maybe I will move on and save 2% or 3%. And maybe next month or maybe next year I'll save 4%. And then maybe a little later on I'll save 5%. Eventually you get to the place where you're able to save 15% of your income. And while saving 15% of your income may seem, that's, that may seem so large, like, Jerry, how in the world could we ever save 15% of our income? Well, friends, just go over and look at people living in Asian countries like China. They have savings rates, personal savings rates of over 40%. Now, why is that? Why do people in China have savings rates of over 40%? Well, largely because they don't have the government safety nets that we have here in America. And so there really is an incentive to save money because if you want to get to retirement with any money, then you have to save money. But here in the United States, we have quite the opposite. We have a system that is breaking down these entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, that make promises, but they're, they're not going to be able to be kept many years out. And so therefore, it's kind of an illusion. So people don't save money here in America because they think, well, the government will take care of me whenever I get older. Well, we'll just have to see about that. We'll just have to see about that because I don't see how they're going to be able to afford to do that. So the onus is really comes upon the individual. It really comes down to you. The important thing to do is to begin to save money now and to begin saving it systematically. It's time for you to finally earn a profit from your labor if you have not been doing so up until this point. Remember, saving money is wise. It's wise because it provides you with a buffer in the event that something down the road is unforeseen that you can't know about arises. It's biblical. It makes common sense that you should have control of the profits that are created as a result of your hard work. And the final thing I want to leave with you today before we move on to our next segment is 
the importance of saving systematically. So if you begin to save, maybe you're not saving anything right now. I'm talking to you. You can begin with 1%. You can say, you know what? I'm earning $3,000 a month in this situation. I'm going to take 1% of that every single month and I'm going to set it aside, right? And then maybe next month I'm going to get to one and a half or 2%. And you, and if you're married you're with your spouse together, you can talk about this and set your profit rate and begin to automate that savings. By automating that savings, what you're going to do is make it systematic so it's completely forgotten. You won't have a choice in the matter. Just 1% put into your savings account. Many companies can do that for you. They can put your part of your paycheck into one account and part of your paycheck into another account. You could tell your HR department, look, put 99% of my check in my regular checking account, but put 1% of it into this other savings account that I've started. In our next program, I'm going to take this a little further. I'm going to talk about what to do with this savings. Like how much are you going to save? So let's say you start saving one or 2%. Well, what does that look like? How much are you trying to save? What's the goal with this? And then what will you use this money for? In next week's program, I'm going to get specifically into those questions. And we're going to talk about what's the purpose of your savings and how much should you build? And then once you build it, what should you do with it? So be sure to tune in next week for a follow-up on our discussion. Are you prepared for the next stock market crash? It's not too late to protect yourself and your family with Jerry Robinson's best-selling book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, now in a new audiobook format. Whether you want to listen in the car, at the gym, or on your iPad, we've got you covered. Get the entire 300-page book in audio format for only $24.95. That's over 12 hours of Jerry Robinson's economic wisdom, financial insights, and practical money-making strategies for only $24.95. Inside this new audiobook, you'll learn 21 profitable income streams you can create both now and in retirement, along with unique tips on how to inflation-proof your investment portfolio using our own PACE philosophy and our five levels of financial freedom, which is Jerry Robinson's personal blueprint for building true wealth. If your goal is to become a better investor, increase your income, or just understand what is really happening in the global economy, you cannot afford to miss out on the vital information that is jam-packed into this 12-hour audio book. Get instant access to Bankruptcy of Our Nation in audio format right now by going online to www.ftmdaily.com slash bankruptcy. That's ftmdaily.com slash bankruptcy. Download your copy today and get on the fast track to true wealth and a lifetime of financial security. Follow the Money Weekly presents your Precious Metals Market Update. Here's Tom Cloud. Jerry, it is great to be back. It just seems like everything is so cautious this day. Everybody's digging deeper in the root of each investment and each economic trend. So we see a lot of that in my market right now. Yeah, Tom. Well, thanks for taking time to join us here on uh, Follow the Money. You know, it's we really look forward to your weekly updates, keeping us in the loop of what's happening with the gold and silver markets from a veteran who's been doing this for a long time. I mean, I, when I say veteran, I don't mean military veteran. I mean veteran precious metals dealer. You've been doing this for a long time, since the 1970s. You've seen all kinds of cycles. You've seen all kinds of presidents. You've seen all kinds of Fed actions, right, since the 1970s. What do you make of the current Trump administration, the current Treasury Department, and the current Federal Reserve, how they're working together? What do you see as we're going forward right now? Is this unusual compared to what you've seen in the past? Yes, it is, Jerry. First of all, we know that uh, history shows as the first year of a Republican president, the average for gold is 23%. The first year average for a Democrat is 5% up, and Republicans 23%. And we think that will come up because of what you want to know is the background of what the Fed that's come in now with Munchen, who's a Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan type guy that was one of the most controversial picks that Trump made, but he felt comfortable with him as the Treasury Secretary. But 
what you got to look at is the conflict at the Fed. And most of your listeners know the Federal Reserve is a private company. The only government employee is Janet Yellen, who carries two passports, a Israeli passport and a U.S. passport, uh, as does Fisher, her assistant. So what we're looking at is the Fed wants to keep control, as the, as the wealthy bankers in the world do, and yet Munchen is talking about things the Treasury can do, and it looks like, to me and others, it's going to be very conflicting that you're out there, and this is something we've really got to watch because when all this will come to a head is when interest rates go up one, two, or three more times and the securitized debt in the world and it's already liquidated about 10 to 15 percent since Trump was elected, will go further. And if you remember one of the things, I, statements I made on your uh, update about two or three weeks ago, at the end of 2015, we had $94 trillion of secured bond debt worldwide. And while we don't have the figures yet for the end of 2016, we should in about a month, uh, but just seeing uh, a market that is only $3 trillion of gold and silver out of $369 trillion of investment. So basically 1%. So just think if 1% rose out of bonds and into gold and silver, we get a 33% increase right there, you know, on a constant dollar. So that would make you know, go to silver, go up substantially. And we think that is what's happening. We're seeing a lot of it. And uh, one thing we'll get to in a few minutes is uh, what's going on in the Netherlands and France, because I think it's very important to bring that up. But right now the Fed is the first time that we've seen in eight years of George W. Bush and eight years of Obama where the Treasury and the Fed have conflict that's already brewing. It's pretty uh, dangerous, I think, a pretty dangerous uh, situation that we're in. We've been in a dangerous situation for a long time, Tom, as you well know. I mean, it's just a very dangerous situation all around with the excessive amounts of tampering into the economy by the Federal Reserve, uh, this constant reliance upon debt, which has been good for gold. Uh, and it's also been good for stock prices because leverage, you know, in a leverage world, things just seem to make sense in an upside down way. But eventually this whole thing is going to come to a screeching halt. Uh, and we don't know what form that's going to take. We don't know what it's going to look like. We just know that math is real. One plus one is two. And you cannot continue to build a house of cards and expect that it won't eventually come down with a little bit of wind. And the no, I don't know what that wind's going to be, Tom. I don't know if you know either, but but I know eventually that people are going to be running to gold. They're going to be running to real things, and we're we're already sort of seeing that. Although I will say that when I compare the charts, Tom, and I want to get your take on this, when I compare the charts from 2016, the very beginning of 2016, we called the uptrend in gold and silver. So you know, here we're trend traders. We focus on trend trading. And so we, we got in in February, very early February, February 1st, got into gold and silver, silver mining, gold mining, and rode that nicely all the way till October when it began to break down. And then we've been out, and now we are just getting back in this week, well, last week, into silver. Uh, we're also looking very closely at gold this week. It seems to be doing something interesting. We don't have the same volume level on the charts that I'm seeing in the beginning of 2017 as we had at the beginning of 2016. Do you have any comments on the volume levels right now on gold? Why are we not seeing a flood of money go in there, or do you anticipate that's going to be seen this year? Well, I do anticipate it's going to be seen this year, but I do want to back up to your opening statement. We do not know what it's going to look like, and basically it could come in the form of inflation or deflation. And, you know, it really is. Even an expert that's been in this thing as long as, Myself and many many economists you read out there, they can paint a picture that will show the system cracking and, and just having deep drops in stocks. And uh, others show stocks going up because the inflation, the world will give Trump a chance to inflate. We know he became a billionaire on other people's money, borrowing money. He doesn't mind going in debt if he thinks he'll go an extra trillion dollars in debt 
and take our debt from twenty trillion to twenty one trillion and everybody knows this first year we're gonna have a huge deficit under Trump. There's no way it's not going to be. You can't increase all these spending. So this is unbelievable for gold and silver. I mean it's just out there right now and the only thing that what you said that nobody understands is why we don't have the volume we had uh, this time last year when gold and silver came out of the, uh, like you said, up the first eight months before falling off the last four months. And they're starting this year exactly the same. Now, yeah, yeah, it looks what just we the don't same. Have, yeah, it's just the same. But it, what we don't have is, is, like you said, we don't have the volume right now, the volume of gold and silver, except we have seen a big pickup in ETFs. But on the fiscal side, where people should be buying, uh, they're not buying. So we're seeing people enter the gold and silver market through ETFs, and because there hasn't been a breakdown, they continue to, to enter the market. But what I can tell you is it's the opposite in uh, uh, central banks. There, there's been over 134, I think it's $134 billion that's come out since Trump was elected. It's gone from U.S. Treasuries, where you've seen the Chinese liquidating and putting the money in, in gold, and a lot of those sales are being originated in Asia, and now I've got an incredible relationship with one of the biggest wholesalers in uh, Singapore, and it is just a new relationship in the last um, two months. So, I mean, I'm able to follow a lot closer on the demand and actual big sales coming out that I haven't been able to before. So we're not seeing commercial sales, but we are seeing the sales taking place in you know, the ETFs and what I sell and the volume, and it is down so far this year. And even though the price has exploded out of the gates for January and so far in February, and we expect that to continue. But there's no question, uh, I think the best comment I'll give you is I was talking to a billionaire. I had the rare opportunity to talk to a billionaire through a mutual friend about three weeks ago, and and the reason he had asked his friend if he knew anybody in the gold business he could trust was he woke up one night and he described this to me in a sweat and realized that he had about 50 million bucks in real estate, which is 5% of his portfolio. Everything else he had was a piece of paper. He said he just started thinking about it. He couldn't even get his own stock certificates. He had a piece of paper for the rest of his thing, and he said, I don't have anything that's liquid anywhere in the world. I don't have anything that's tangible besides some real estate. And he said, it just started bothering me, and I've never even thought about owning gold until now. I'm scared not to own gold for insurance purposes and having something that's liquid anywhere in the world and accepted anywhere in the world. And, Jerry, that's the thinking that has to change that we don't understand it because we've done it a long time while people aren't out there, because I've said many times, there's no insurance policy in the world, even if gold went down 15%. It's not, in my opinion, but if it did, and you cashed out, it's still a cheap insurance policy to be carrying. There's no other insurance you get your money back. You're taking a risk, you're covering a risk. So you just can't paint a picture of anything right now more perfect to own than gold for the world getting smaller, the world wanting gold and silver and not. And then the last thing, as I said, I would comment on is what's going on in the Netherlands and France. Just think about we've got a Netherlands situation right now where next month in March you got an election and the guy leading is a pro-Trump guy. He's wanting to block Muslims from coming in his country, and he wants to exit, have another Brexit. He wants to exit and go back to the Gilder. And then you have the Lady Pen in France, there's elections in April, and she's talking about, she's very pro and doing something about the Muslim and immigration and talking about going back to the French Frank. And you're talking about chaos in the world. I mean, this could lead to a deflationary move in the stock market that's unprecedented. Is people, and you could have 100% inflation in Italy in a year if they had to go back to the printing presses of their own. So 
you know, we've got to be cautious, Jerry, and that's what I love about your show. You're telling people to be cautious in all areas. It's like with your stock sales, buy and sell up things you put out. I mean, you're looking at trends and you're looking at building up, and that's right now. And I do agree with you that gold doesn't look, it looks trend neutral as of last week, but it's changing. Yes. And I believe like silver and uh, platinum, it's going to send off a huge buy signal any day now. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next week. But I think you're getting ready to see a move up strong in gold. What do you say, Tom, to those who are listening to this broadcast and they say, this is true. I mean, there is a lot of problems around the world and there's a lot of uncertainty. And so that's why I have my money in bonds. I'm not going to get in the stock market. I'm not going to get in anything else. What do you say to those people who are over leveraged or feel some sort of comfort to take comfort in holding bonds right now? What's your view on bonds? The only way bonds are going to win is going to be if this election and uh, Netherlands and France turn into a world taking the other side that we talked about in the opening. When, when I opened today is you can interpret what that's going to do. Will they be able to inflate enough? If they do, of course, bonds are going to be the worst possible place you could have a penny. Those things will go and people will start liquidating the U.S. bonds and then the Treasury and the Fed will start fighting over because the Fed says they're not going to keep bailing out the bond market because, Jerry, there's no bids. I mean, look at the last two auctions of treasuries. Yeah. Nobody wants them. I mean, who would want something that you know has gone up for 36 years and now mm -hmm. it's turned and put on a sales signal in everything you read? I mean, there's nobody out there. So poor people holding bonds, I mean, it's okay if they want to hold them through, you know, April, May, but if those two things happen in in Netherlands and France, I think I know one thing. I I wouldn't be holding a bond because you could see uh, some huge losses, you know, coming because people are going to liquidate U.S. Treasury. But if we go into a real depression, then certainly money's going to move the bonds, just like you said, and people will sit there knowing that there's going to be inflated out. But on the short term, you may gain the five or ten percent. The bonds are down since uh, Trump was elected. So it is something people need to stay tuned into your show and, and know because you and I don't know. We've got experience, but we don't know how it's going to play out, like you said. So it, it's important to, to not just sit there and say, I'm going to hold this bond to maturity. That's not a, to me, that's not an option. You do that, you're going to lose you know, most of the principle of it because in the long run, the dollar is going to fail, and we all know that. It's just we can't keep the deficits going and keep this market propped up, the dollar market. Right now it's propped up because other countries are in worse shape and uncertainty than we are. You're listening to the voice of Tom Cloud. He is a precious metals dealer. He's been in the business since 1977. You can reach out to him by phone. Talk to him personally, 800-247-2812. When you call him, let him know you heard him on Follow the Money and he'll throw in a pretty good offer, make you a really good deal on gold and silver. Tom, uh, you talk to a lot of people on the phone. Your office talks to a lot of clients. You have clients all over the world, and especially the United States. What is the general tone that you're hearing in their voice whenever they call after you know, post-Trump? Are they nervous about Trump? Are they nervously optimistic? Are they fearful? What's the general tone you're sensing in the voices of your clients? Well, it runs a gamut, Jerry. You, you've named a couple of them. It, I mean, overall, I think they're going to give. Yeah, but every day the stock market doesn't take off, I can tell you it's – I mean, I talked to a guy a month ago, and then he calls back, and the stock market hasn't done what he expected it to do under Trump. And I told him, I said, you know, we still got the tax cuts to debate, and especially getting the corporate one done, and then eventually the personal rates – so I think you got mostly cautiously, cautiously optimistic, but also very scared about the debt going higher, very scared about Trump's um, flipping attitude. It doesn't make any difference how big the deficit is. You put people back to work, and, you know, down the road two or three years, the tax base increases. But uh, there are a lot of people that don't think we can do that for two years, that uh, – 
in two years you run up two or three trillion dollars more then the bond market's gone so there's just so many different things people believe but the one thing that they are constant you know on is that they do need to have the percentage of metals they want in their portfolio and that percentage runs a gamut uh, so we're happy to talk to people about uh, that but right now you just don't have one prevailing issue of what people think it's just it's very wide spread what people think the trump years are going to bring it seems to me tom that especially after the recent decision by the trump administration to really begin slashing financial regulations it's a very hot topic there's a lot of divisiveness about it whether regulations are good or bad or whatever we don't want to get into that necessarily but mainly the fact that there does seem to be the taking off of the handcuffs, so to speak, of the financial industry, that bodes well for gold, does it not? Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, it definitely bodes well for gold. And like I said last week in the video, it, I mean, I've had a money manager fly here from Illinois to meet, has over a billion and a half dollars, and they have clients asking about gold, plus they're looking at go for the first time and I think that's the biggest part of my business that's you know that even though and we've seen a very large sale here recently through a money manager so you know you have people looking they're not they're doing their homework some are moving in some are building toward getting all the answers to their questions but absolutely this regulation stuff all boats really really well for gold and uh, certainly I still think that Inflation is going to be the end product. I think Trump doesn't mind doing that. And certainly if Europe breaks down, all these countries go back to their own currency, they're going to have to print money like crazy just to get the economy jump-started. So we're in for some very, a very interesting first two years of Trump's administration. And like I said, I expect much higher debt. I mean, I'm talking about running higher deficits than Obama ran for the first two years. You can't cut taxes and increase spending and expect the deficit to go down. It doesn't work that way. Tom, I sure do appreciate you. I know that you have been uh, a steady voice of reason for many, many years for much of our audience. We sure do appreciate your support over the years and your continued uh, participation. Uh, If you would, in our final moments, would you just tell our folks what to expect when they call you and what you can do for them? Yeah, Jerry, we've been doing this since 1977, like you said, and uh, Dan, you know, will answer the phone. He's been with me 23 or 4 years, and Kathleen's been with me 7 years. So uh, they're the traders, people you would talk to. And if you need to talk to me, you just I'll call you back if I'm busy. Uh, but, yeah, we'll just talk to you about the different kinds of gold and silver and the pros and cons of each one and uh, get where in the options of whether you want to take delivery of it or have it stored in one of the five warehouses worldwide that, We've made special arrangements with, especially the one in Delaware and Canada where we have the lowest rates in the world for people that do not want to take possession. So we can get them an incredible storage deal or deliver it to them. And like you said, just mention that they heard me here and they'll be locked in for no postage ever. If they come through you, we put them in there and they're flagged and they don't have to ever pay postage and insurance. So, yeah, they expect that we don't think any questions are done. We like to people to feel comfortable with what they're buying. Fantastic. If you want to reach out to Tom, you can do so, 800-247-2812. Sure do appreciate your insights today, Tom. We'll talk again soon. All right, Jerry. Thank you. Hey friends, this is Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly. Recently, we have been receiving many emails from our listeners commenting on the great help they're getting from our precious metals expert, Tom Cloud. Gold and silver are excellent hedges against the growing threat of coming U.S. inflation. Who's your gold guy? Make it Tom Cloud. With over 30 years' experience with precious metals, Tom will answer all of your questions. Don't buy your gold and silver through some call center and pay inflated prices. Call my good friend Tom Cloud and speak directly with him and get all of your questions answered. For a limited time, Tom is offering free shipping and insurance on every gold and silver purchase made by our listeners. Call. 
800-247-2812. And when you do, tell him that Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly sent you. And he'll throw in that free shipping and insurance on your entire order. Call your gold guy, Tom Cloud, right now for the very best deals on gold and silver coins. 800-247-2812. That is 800-247-2812. All right, friends, and that brings us to the end of our program. Thank you so much for choosing to allow us into your life each and every week right here on this broadcast. And as always, I like to leave you with this final word. This time it's taken from a book I've been reading called The Lessons of History by Will and Ariel Durant. It's a fantastic book. I don't know if many of you have read the historical works by Will and Ariel Durant. They were a married couple who wrote prolifically here in the United States over the last uh, several decades. Fantastic uh, historical series that I have, a big volume book set that I have. But also, there is a little condensed book called The Lessons of History that these two wrote. And in essence, what it is, is it's taking all of the different things that they've learned from history and trying to distill it down into lessons. One of the lessons that they took away is this quote, history is colorblind and can develop a civilization in any favorable environment under almost any skin. I found that statement to be very, very powerful today because friends, there really is one human race, one human race, all of us. We may have different skin pigmentation colors. That's really all the difference is we are one human race created by God and responsible as brothers and sisters to one another. Just something to think about. Remember friends, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. Have a safe and prosperous week and we'll see you right back here next time. Until then, God bless. All of the information contained on the Follow the Money podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes. It should not be construed as specific investment advice. The views and opinions of our guests and sponsors, including Tom Cloud, are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Robinson Media Group, LLC. Jerry Robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products. Follow-up, individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations. Past performance is not indicative of future results. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussion on the podcast. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and always consult a trusted financial